rock and roll. Um, so thank you, Tarek. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you, the organizers. Um, any other organizers that I may be forgetting. Um, today I'm going to tell you about Dharma. So Dharma, in a one-sentence nutshell, is a protocol for borrowing and lending tokens. Um, we have been live on the Ethereum mainnet since May of 2018. Um, there's been around $150,000 in loans that have been issued uh, with Dharma so far. And ignore that little last part there because this is from a hackathon presentation. So I'm not giving any prizes to any of you guys, unfortunately. Um, so in this talk, we're going to talk about, uh, first of all, like, why did we build this? Like, what is the point of all of this? Uh, then we're going to try to get into some of these sort of nuts and bolts of how the protocol actually works. Um, this is when I'm going to get uh, very dry and boring, as Tarek said. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about how you guys, as cryptocurrency developers, can get started hacking on top of Dharma. So why? I'm going to make a claim that the world economy runs on debt. And this is like a very kind of like... Um, a double-edged sword in a sense, because debt has this kind of negative connotation that, um, you know, we think about things like student debt or uh, like the federal deficit or things like that. Um, but really, I'm going to make a claim that it's kind of a, a, a double-edged sword that um, is really endemic to our day-to-day -day lives in so many different ways. So first of all, the houses that we sleep in are funded by mortgages. The cars that we drive in are often funded by auto loans. The businesses that employ us stock inventory using business loans. The infrastructure that we build is financed by bonds. The education we received is funded by student loans. The states that even govern us are funded by sovereign bonds. And so there's so many parts of our lives that are in some way, shape, or form funded by debt. And the system that kind of lies in the background and actually enables um, debt to function um, is what we refer to as the debt capital markets, which is essentially like the global system in which debts are issued and traded. And they do that a lot, actually. So um, over here on the far left, um, we have the total crypto market cap, which um, I don't know if this figure is current given the, the volatility that happened today, but um, at time of minting for this, uh, this presentation was $200 billion. Um, then we have kind of the total equities market, which is markedly larger at $65 trillion. Think, you know, stocks and kind of like um, traditional equities in that sense. Um, and then in the far right, we have the global debt market cap, which is at $217 trillion. This is, I believe, the second largest asset class in the world, with the first being derivatives by like a huge, huge long shot. But that's, that's a topic of conversation for another time. Clearly, um, counterintuitively, there are much more bonds and debt instruments in the world than there are stocks in kind of major companies like Apple or Amazon or what have you. But debt capital markets have serious flaws baked into them. So first of all, debt markets are notoriously inefficient. Um, and I'll give kind of three examples of, of their inefficiencies. So first of all, what is a debt agreement but basically a legal contract between two parties where one party says, I promise to pay you back like X amount of dollars at Y interest rate, and if I don't do that, Z, you know, bad thing is going to happen to me. Um, and the thing about legal agreements that are kind of drafted in Microsoft Word is that they are very messy and non-deterministic. And you kind of have to be somewhat of a trained expert in order to draft them. And then if something goes wrong, you have to go to court uh, and then basically have that same sort of expertise in order to argue your case as to why this contract ought to be enforced in a certain way. And so you have to pay lawyers to essentially help you um, both uh, issue things like debts, but also kind of adjudicate them when things go wrong. And so lawyers basically end up extracting rent from the process, um, and then that rent is, is eventually paid for by borrowers and lenders in some capacity. Number two, there are these parties called paying agents that similarly kind of sit in the middle and extract some sort of rent from the debt issuance and trading process. So paying agents is kind of like a broad class of actors that basically like facilitate the trading of different debt agreements. So let's just say Alice has lent like $100 to Bob. Um, now Alice owns the rights to receive $110, let's just say, 
in like a year. But what if Alice wants to go and then sell her rights to do this um, to Charlie? Um, so if we're gonna make this happen, um, it, it would be very impractical for this to happen at scale if Bob had to always keep track of who the person is that owns their loan so that they could repay the correct person. So in practice, what happens is that there's what's known as a paying agent, somebody that's basically kind of sitting in the middle and keeping track of who owns the, the loan at any given time and is the recipient of repayments from the borrower and then takes that and routes it to the correct owner of a given debt instrument. Similarly, these people need to eat and so they extract some sort of rent and that rent eventually gets paid by the borrowers and lenders. And then finally, um, the last example I give is, is escrow agents, right? So particularly if the loan is collateralized in some capacity, um, usually there has to be some sort of entity that is going to be holding that collateral as a sort of trusted third party so that if you end up defaulting on the loan, um, the trusted third party is going to take the collateral and give it to the creditor. Um, similarly, they're doing this for a price. So they're, they're extracting a rent from the process and borrowers and lenders at the end of the day pay for that in interest rates that are less friendly to them. Number two, debt markets are notoriously opaque. So this, this is a little bit of an esoteric diagram, but, but does anybody recognize what this is? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> all right, okay. Um, so this is a diagram of a collateralized debt obligation. Um, or a CDO. These are a notorious class of financial instruments that are often blamed for the financial crisis. And basically what happens here is big banks would take tons and tons of mortgages, package them up into a singular instrument, carve out all sorts of like really interesting ways in which the, the cash flows kind of uh, uh, were paid out in that whole instrument, um, and then would sell them off again. Um, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with CDOs in and of themselves. Um, like they are a really important way of bringing liquidity into debt capital markets. Um, but what is problematic about them is that um, in the run up to the financial crisis, they were extremely difficult to analyze and understand. Um, and basically these big banks would end up paying third party rating agencies to go and give them their blessing as you know, triple A rated or double A rated or what have you. Um, and there's a really crappy incentive mismatch there around you paying somebody to rate something honestly um, that you're about to sell. Um, and so essentially that just led to us having a bunch of these CDOs that were like all over the marketplace owned by a bunch of different banks. Um, and they were all basically like full of shit. Um, and nobody really knew that. And this is kind of one of the big culprits in the uh, 2007 financial crisis. But most importantly though, debt markets are far from universally accessible. And I'm gonna share some stats in, in kind of, uh, in support of this. So you guys have probably heard this before. Um, there are over two billion adults that are either unbanked or underbanked in the world. Um, but in tandem, they are all rapidly coming online through cheap commodity smartphones. But it's not like if you're in a, say, a village in India and you want to take out a loan, you can't go to LendingClub.com and take out a loan at an American interest rate or go to a Chinese peer-to-peer -peer lending site uh, and lend your money out there in order to earn some sort of interest. And the reason for this is that while HTTP doesn't necessarily have any concept of borders, the sort of financial system that undergirds all of these financial services very much does. So if debt capital markets are inefficient, they're opaque, and they lack universal accessibility, how can we build something better? Lo and behold, we have programmable money now. So our kind of fundamental belief here is that there's been a sort of step function change uh, in what was possible and what was not um, with the sort of advent of programmable blockchains. Um, and we think that this is kind of like the, the ground layer of what will eventually be a open financial system in which people um, are able to access financial services uh, with the same sort of lack of friction that they load an HTTP website from anywhere in the world. So, Blockchains give us the tools to build credit markets in particular that are A, efficient in that the loans are entirely peer-to-peer -peer without any sort of rent-seeking intermediary standing between the borrower and lender. 
Um, they can enable us to build credit markets that are transparent by default, meaning that at any given time, somebody can go and look on the ledger and see what the state is of the entire loan market, um, get an idea of what loans have been defaulted on, what uh, leverage looks like in the system, et cetera. Um, and then finally, they enable us to build credit markets that are entirely universally accessible. So right now, um, you know, I'm obviously alluding here to Dharma. Um, right now, you can access the Dharma, like the Dharma credit market quite literally from anywhere in the world where you have access to an internet connection. And that's a really, really powerful concept. So how does this actually work? So at a high level, a like thousand foot overview, we like to think of Dharma as kind of being like this financial middleware layer that sits on top of the Ethereum blockchain. We're not ETH maximalists. For all we know, there might be a future in which there's like a gazillion different blockchains, or maybe like two or three, or maybe just one. Um, the point is, is that like we, we think of ourselves as a blockchain agnostic layer that sits on top of um, you know, sufficiently featureful blockchains um, and basically provides this kind of globally accessible, decentralized liquid credit market on top of which a whole range of other financial services can be built on. So those include things like building interesting credit derivatives, building kind of peer-to-peer -peer lending sites, or even building secondary markets in which you can trade different loans as if they were just tokens. So getting more into the specifics here, um, we're gonna go over this kind of in three steps. So uh, there's, there's kind of three things that you need in order to have a sort of credit market um, from a technical perspective. The first thing is, is that you need a way to define the terms of a loan unambiguously and programmatically. Um, you need a way to express an intent to actually borrow or lend. So express the idea like, I want to borrow this much at these terms, I want to lend this much at these terms. Um, and then finally, you need to find a counterparty. So you need to actually be able to go out there and find somebody that wants to lend you that money or find somebody that wants to borrow from you at those rates. So let's go into how we tackle number one first. So we come up with this concept of what we refer to as a terms contract. How many of you guys have ever played around with Solidity before? Okay, so this, this, this may be familiar terminology, it may not, um, but for, for the programmers in the audience, like, it is a interface in the same way as any sort of other object-oriented languages has interfaces. So essentially, uh, and a terms contract is kind of like this generic mechanism by which you can define almost any debts kind of terms uh, and conditions um, unambiguously and in a sort of standardized format. And the way that we do that is that you basically like, if you want to create a loan that has some you know, exotic parameters to it, um, you would create a contract that adheres to this interface and then you would define three sort of methods that, um, that kind of are the core sort of uh, determinants of its terms. So the first is just like what happens when someone repays a certain amount, like how does that affect the, um, the balance of the loan. Number two, um, get expected repayment value, like what at this given point in time does the debt agreement expect to have been paid back. And then finally, like number three, what value has already been repaid. And the idea here is that like now, if I were to go and um, like look over a list of like 10,000 different Dharma loans and they all have different terms contracts to them, each of which like has a different code base and like I don't even, you know, it's like I, I, you know, I don't have the time to sort of categorize them in one way, I can programmatically scroll through all of those and tell you how many of them are say like in default because they all expose the same sort of standardized interface that explains like what the terms of the loans actually are. And so zooming back a bit, you can kind of think of this as being akin to a loan template. So it's basically kind of like a, um, you know, this is very much the most optimistic case of what a loan agreement looks like. They're usually much, much, much more uh, dense than that. Um, but basically, a terms contract is kind of like a, a template that says like, um, you know, like blank promised to pay blank back, uh, blank at blank interest rate. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then blank happens to blank. Um, and the idea is that these can be reused for different uh, loan agreements um, so that you don't have to constantly deploy a new contract on a per loan basis. So that's great. We've now defined the terms of a debt. That's not particularly useful in and of itself though. 
Um, now we want to actually express an intent to either borrow or lend in some capacity. And this is where we introduce the primitive of a debt order. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with something called the 0x protocol? By a show of hands. Okay, excellent. So this is extremely analogous to the 0x protocol's concept of an order. Um, and essentially, um, what it is, is it's basically just a signed message, a signed like packet of data that indicates that I, as a borrower, commit to a certain set of repayment terms um, and wish to receive a certain principal amount. And so you, you'll notice there's sort of an abridged um, overview of what a debt order looks like over here. You have basically a person's desired principal, the address of a terms contract, so an address of one of these sort of loan templates, and then like the parameters that fit into that actual loan template. So in the example I gave earlier, it would have been like, you know, simple interest terms contract, and then like interest rate, 10%, uh, like, you know, whatever. Um, and then finally, you attach some sort of signature into there so that programmatically we know that the person at address X has actually committed to these terms. Now, what can we do with a debt order like in a vacuum, like, a, you know, in, in a world in which like, I already know who's going to lend me this money, or I, I know like over, in an over-the-counter situation that they want to lend me this money. So we're going to bring back our proverbial uh, friends, Alice and Bob, here. Um, and Alice and Bob, Alice has 100 ETH, and Bob has 100 DAI, and we have some like stellar iconography down here representing the Dharma Smart Contracts. So Alice is going to go and send her signed debt order over to Bob. And now Bob's gonna kind of evaluate that. He's gonna look at the terms contract. He's gonna plug in the terms contract parameters. He's gonna see like, oh, these are the terms of this loan that I'm about to take to invest in. Oh, this looks really attractive to me. I wanna earn an interest rate. Um, and so he's then gonna go and submit that debt order to the Dharma Smart Contracts. The Dharma Smart Contracts then are going to settle the transaction, meaning they're gonna evaluate the debt order. They're going to essentially validate that the debtor's signature is correct. And if they validate the terms all make sense, and Alice really did consent to this loan, they're gonna go and pull 100 DAI out of Bob's um, account, transfer it over to Alice, and then in this particular case, and mind you, this is, um, this is specific to the way most loans happen in Dharma today, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little more later, um, the Dharma smart contracts are gonna pull 100 ETH out of Alice's account and escrow them as collateral, essentially for the loan. And then finally, the Dharma smart contracts are gonna go and issue what we refer to as a debt token to Bob. And the debt token you might notice has like a weird kind of string of hexadecimal num like letters and numbers next to it. That's because it is a non-fungible token. It's not a, um, a fungible token. This isn't like the Dharma native token. By the way, there's no Dharma native token. Uh, <laughs> uh, contrary to Tarek's belief. Um, so, uh, so what's neat about this debt token is that anybody who holds this debt token at any given time is entitled to the repayments in this loan. That makes it super easy for basically these loans to be traded and repackaged in secondary markets because all you have to do is just kind of send somebody a token in order to transfer the loan over. So that's great, but not everybody has like a readily available Bob that is just you know, willing to lend them money at, any, you know, at the drop of a hat. And so we need to be able to find a counterparty to fill that order. And this is where we introduce the concept of relayers. Again, very, very similar to the 0x protocol. It's functionally the same concept, uh, only instead of matching makers and takers, it's matching borrowers and lenders. And so essentially, relayers are these like businesses that go and aggregate signed order messages in some sort of public order book. And every time a uh, counterparty fills one of these orders um, off of that order book, they're gonna go and earn some sort of predefined fee. So a great example of a relayer in the Dharma ecosystem is Blockboard. Um, they were the first relayer to go live in Dharma. Right now there are three relayers actually. Um, and basically, like you can see, it just kind of looks like a, um, a order book of a DEX or like a kind of um, uh, like a peer-to-peer -peer lending site with different offers on it for, for different terms of loans. And then what's crucial to understand about this is that 
Um, every time one of these orders is filled, Blockboard is going to earn some sort of fee. That's their incentive for doing this. And crucially, the whole process is non-custodial. So, so Blockboard isn't touching anyone's funds at any given point in time. So the second class of actors that I want to talk about um, is what we refer to as underwriters. Um, and so an underwriter, basically like the, the reason why we created this entity is that like um, it's not particularly useful um, to have a bunch of loan agreements to invest in if you have no good way of assessing how risky that investment is. Now, in certain kinds of loans, you don't necessarily need a third party to do that. For instance, if the loan is like heavily, heavily over collateralized and there's not like any sort of counterparty risk. But in a lot of lending use cases, you kind of need to have somebody that's going to sit there and vouch for the credit worthiness of the loan. And this is where the concept of an underwriter comes in. So an underwriter is a trusted entity that collects market determined fees for essentially originating the borrower. So actually like, you know, somehow getting their debt order onto the actual relayers website, um, determining and negotiating the terms in the debt. Um, and then finally, like most importantly, cryptographically committing to their, li their perceived likelihood um, that the loan is going to default. And so you can kind of think of them as these sort of entities that go and make predictions about how likely they think it is that a certain borrower is going to default and earn a fee once the loan is filled. But the crucial sort of incentive mechanism for why they would do this and why they're accountable is that their predictions get recorded immutably on chain. And so essentially, if you're a really good underwriter and you do a really good job of sourcing good borrowers, of you know, checking their credit worthiness, of incentivizing them to repay by whatever means you have, be that you know, a legal contract or on-chain collateral or like a crowbar and some like um, tweezers or I don't, I don't know, we know what you do with tweezers. Um, <laughs> like if you're doing a really good job, then you'd be able to essentially like go through the underwriter's whole history and see that they've essentially like always vouched for good borrowers and their predictions have always come true. Conversely, if they were doing a bad job, you'd be able to, you'd be able to see that as well. So this kind of version one of this protocol is that effectively the market will gravitate people towards underwriters. Tarek. Currently, yes, yeah. So today, um, in, in the current, so this is this zooms things out to like the more broader kind of context of Dharma. Right now, the vast majority of the reason people are using Dharma is for margin lending. So like that is like, it's like primarily today people are using this for margin trading. This is actually more broadly what people are using decentralized finance more for the most part is just like different forms of speculative lending. Um, and so in that particular use case, like you don't necessarily need an underwriter. There are certain reasons why um, there you would want an underwriter in a margin loan, in particular in order to have somebody that's going to like facilitate margin calls and actually kind of like um, make sure that the lender doesn't have to like run a server that watches the loan agreement. Um, but um, I'm happy to dive more into that later. It's, it's a little bit of a tangent um, that's, that's kind of not fitting into the slides. <laughs> um, so, you know, like giving the end to end flow again, what this would look like is like um, if Alice kind of like first, instead of Alice doesn't even know about one of these relayers, she doesn't give a crap about relayers, she just like went to a website that says like getalone.com, and that website is an underwriter. And so she's going to go there, the underwriter is going to essentially evaluate her credit worthiness somehow, say like, hmm. If Alice were to put up 100 ETH of collateral and get 100 DAI, like based on my uh, you know, magical data science model, how, much, how likely do I think it is that Alice is actually going to repay? Um, and so the underwriter then is going to attest to her credit worthiness, kind of co-sign onto that debt order. The debt order is going to go and get posted on a relayer's order book. And then Bob is going to see it there, see that this underwriter has attested to her credit worthiness. Um, evaluate the underwriter's prior performance, presumably programmatically, um, and then he's going to actually choose to invest in the same old like spiel happens. Um, are you raising your hand or? Oh, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, cool. So you guys are developers. How do you get started actually building stuff on top of Dharma? 
So we built a whole suite of developer tools to make this super easy for even people who've never actually um, worked with Solidity before. So we have these neat Dharma JS libraries that kind of abstract away all the smart contracts and uh, make it so that even if you only know JavaScript, you should be able to build a peer-to-peer -peer lending application on top of Dharma. Um, we have a developer portal that is ruthlessly sort of uh, thorough and giving an explanation of how Dharma works, uh, giving tutorials of where you can get started. Um, it's at developer.dharma.io. Um, that's where you can get a much more gory explanation of how everything works. If this wasn't sufficiently gory for you guys. Um, we have this thing called the Relayer Kit. Um, and so we're pretty jazzed about this because basically um, you can kind of download this thing um, and get it kind of spun up on your local computer in five minutes and start earning cryptocurrency fees for relaying orders in Dharma um, super, super quickly, um, which we think is super awesome. And we've built it in this like very generic way where it's super easy for you to kind of skin it in your own ways and add your own branding and whatnot. And I'm just gonna list out some like really interesting things that we think are cool for people to build on top of Dharma. Um, so the first is just like more relayers. <laughs> like we think that there's just like a big business opportunity here for like earning fees. Um, and it's super easy to get started. You could do it in a weekend. Um, the other is this notion of collateralized collectibles. We were actually just talking about this a little bit before, but um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with NFTs. Um, there are lots of really exciting new classes of NFTs that are coming out, um, some of which can become very valuable. Um, and your crypto kitty, like in a vacuum, isn't super like useful for anything other than the fact that it might be traded a certain value in the future. Um, so why not actually tap into the value of that digital collectible and basically take a loan out against it so you have something more useful like you know a stable coin or even ETH to pay for gas for things. So we, we have this concept of creating what we refer to as collateralized collectibles where you can basically use Dharma debt agreements to borrow against your, um, your crypto kitties or your decentralized plots of land or what have you. Um, the, you guys might remember earlier I talked about this idea of CDOs, these kind of like super complex um, financial instruments that wrecked the economy 10 years ago. Um, what's really cool about having a, um, the kind of the reason why I gave that example is that I think this really crystallizes one of like the, the killer use cases for tokenized debt. And that's that like, if you create a CDO on a blockchain using a smart contract to administer the entire system, you are literally cutting away like millions and millions of dollars of administrative and legal costs that are associated with creating these instruments because there's nobody that has to go and set up like a corporation in the Cayman Islands to like facilitate this or draft up hundreds of pages of legal agreements to define the terms of this or take like 10 different banks to court once like the, you know, a couple cents weren't paid in the right way or to the right person. Um, and so like that's what, this is a really kind of exciting way in which we think uh, smart contracts can be used to, to remove a middleman from this process um, and make it much more efficient. And then finally, um, we, there's this concept of what we refer to as Dharma Debt Explorers. Um, there's actually one that's live right now. You can go to loanscan.io and check it out. Um, and basically, one of the neat things about having a credit market that's entirely settled on chain is that it's super transparent and you can get like these like very granular analytics um, about like who is borrowing from whom, um, at what rates, what sort of loans have been defaulted on, et cetera. Um, so you can actually take a look at what this, this looks at, like today at loanscan.io, but we'd love to see more people build them. Uh, it's kind of like the equivalent of block explorers, but for, for Dharma. So that's my talk. Um, I'm happy to answer some more questions. I can also like go more technical and, and, and discuss more, more dry and technical things if that's what you prefer. Um, but I had a lot of fun chatting with you guys today. So I'll, I'll take some questions now, thank you. Yes. Okay, so the question was, um, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier that there's something like two billion people in the world who don't have access to banking. Um, and the question was, how does Dharma solve that problem? So, like, 
first order effect, like next two, three years, not gonna happen. Like this, this is not, the, like this is, we're very far from the future in which I believe digital currencies are actually going to be meaningfully impacting the lives of the unbanked. I kind of view this, like projects like Dharma and, and others that are in the, the quote unquote decentralized finance ecosystem as being like little building blocks that um, we're building kind of like the infrastructure of an alternative financial system that will one day in the future surpass the existing financial system in terms of accessibility and quality and affordability and what have you. It's going to take some time though and the initial use cases are probably not going to be touching people in you know like unbanked countries. Like it's, it's actually most likely going to be like types of financial services that just didn't exist before or serve markets that didn't exist before. For instance, margin lending in cryptocurrencies or um, there's a bunch of other examples I can give. Borrowing against your NFTs, what have you. Um, but the bet that we're making is that like these things start niche. Um, the infrastructure kind of gets built around the, the nichery and then over time it generalizes and matures to, to other use cases of, of financial services. Yes. Yeah, so we've seen some standardization in Ethereum around uh, things like ERC20 for equity like instruments. Mm. What have you seen for standardization around debt instruments, either ERCs within Dharma or other projects that are kind of coalescing? Yeah, excellent question. So the question was around like what sort of standardization has been done around debt instruments. So the answer is like not much. Like the the closest has been Somebody came up with an, AR, an ERC for um, like a loan standard, um, but I think like we made a judgment at the time that it just it seemed pretty low quality, and like we didn't really want to like put ourselves behind it because it, it wasn't really like up to par. Um, and it, it, I think that the um, yeah, I think the, the community would benefit like tremendously if there was one that everybody coalesced around. What's much more important in the short term is like, um, you know, people need to be using these systems like a lot more first. Like that's when it becomes more, it makes more sense to have like a, a kind of uh, standard for, um, for debts because like, um, you know, once you have much more volume flowing through these systems, then like the, the need sort of presents itself. Yes. Um, yes. So the, the short answer is yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I would I would say that the position in which a relayer is in, um, from a regulatory standpoint, is very akin to the positions in which um, various kind of like zero x relayers or dexes are in from a regulatory standpoint. Um, the, I, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't like provide a very like clear. I'm, I'm not. This is not guidance that I'm giving. But like the the issue is is that like. It, it's not so much that like it's n like not allowed to do these things. Like these things are legal to do. It's just extremely unclear how you do it legally and like what regime you're supposed to fall under. Because there's one way of construing it where a um, a relayer is nothing but a bulletin board. They're totally non-custodial. They're just displaying people's orders. Um, they never touch people's money. Um, there's another way of construing it in which they're a broker dealer. Um, because uh, you know, other lists of reasons, because reasons. Uh, <laughs> there's, um, uh, there's an argument that they might need to be an ATS. So there's, so, so there's really, the, the, what I hope for is that there's gonna be more kind of clear guidance from um, various regulators at some point in the future um, with respect to non-custodial financial services. Um, I am optimistic only insofar as like, even the SEC has said they're gonna be giving plain language guidance soon to people who are trying to do token, token sales. So if that trend continues, then hopefully we'll, we'll have a better idea of what the right route forward is. Yes. Totally, yeah. So the, the, the question was like, can I, like, how are the terms of a loan negotiated exactly? Um, the idea is that it's entirely like done off chain um, and most likely programmatically. So, so what I imagine, like the, so to be clear, first of all, like there are no underwriters that are alive in Dharma today. The, pr the primary use case for it has not required a underwriter so far. So this is very much just an academic kind of hypothesis. But what I would imagine a, a standard underwriter would look like is you, 
It's just a website offering loans. And you show up to the website and they, you know, they show you some sort of rate. Like it's gonna cost you this much, you're gonna have to repay on these terms. And then you either accept or you don't. That's basically the negotiation. Um, but, but you could imagine people could go and like create like websites in which you could have a back and forth or maybe this is happening in person. We kind of try to take a very sort of high level generic um, unopinionated construction here at the kind of core settlement layer um, with regards to how terms are negotiated. Yes? Uh, how is the duration of the loan measured? Is it plot height? That's a great question. Um, uh, yes. It's by, I usually, like the way that we do it now, you could technically do it by any sort, you could do it either by timestamp or, um, or by block height. Uh, generally, you want to do stuff based off of um, block height because timestamp can be manipulated by miners and there's all sorts of interesting stuff that can happen there. Yes? So are you still uh, sort of on zero X or you're basically forking it out and building something? So common misconception, we were at one point in time built on top of zero X. Um, we are no longer built on top of them. Um, we do like heavily, we're very close to the team and our, our whole system is extremely similar to theirs in, in architecture um, and like there are, there's like an almost 100% certainty that we will be building things in the future that in some ways integrate into 0x, um, but we are not built on 0x right now. I mean, th this is, that was like a side question, because that would apply to whether to 0x or Darwin's architecture. So what is the, the bandwidth requirements for three layers? I know, I know this is like a because right now the, the volume is so low, right? Uh, what is the if they're all sharing with each other, is what you mean. Yeah, so it's an excellent question. Um, I, will, I will caveat, first of all, like, these are, you know, these are early days right now, so these are, this is very much the, like, the step N plus one sort of problem that we would have if there's, like, like a really tremendous amount of volume going through. Um, for that, I think that the most interesting solution that I've heard, um, there's a project called Paradigm um, that's essentially, um, the, the paradigm network, they're trying to build like functionally a liquidity sharing network that um, instead of a relayer having to broadcast to like a hard coded list of all other relayers, they have like essentially like literally like a blockchain that they like post to that's very, very cheap to post to um, that would like effectively um, be the source of truth or the relay mechanism for, for the other nodes. Um, I'm not in a good position to explain to you how it works because uh, it's not my project, but I think this is the exact problem that they're trying to solve for. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I, I completely, I, I agree. Um, I think that we've taken a development philosophy of not trying to solve problems that like we don't know exist yet. Um, until we kind of get there. Um, and, but you're right, from a computer science perspective, like the, but that. It, but it's also chicken and egg, right? Uh, perhaps there is not enough volume right now because everything is slow. Because so I, I would not agree with that, though. That's the thing. It's like the, um, right now, the, the bigger bottlenecks on like the amount of like volume is just like end user demand. Like that's, that's the basic issue. And even there, right now, there wouldn't be like, any sort of latency issues because if you just go and post an order on Blockboard, they'll have it up there immediately, and then perhaps like they'll have some Chrome job that runs and then like you know propagates it to QuickLine, the other relay or something like that. Um, and so we're not it, we're, we haven't yet crossed a, a, a threshold in which that like that is a material problem. I, I agree with you that like it could be at some point for sure. So 
So yeah, um, the question was like how, in the event in which a borrower doesn't repay, um, how are, like, what is the recourse that a lender has in order to get back their principal? Um, so this is precisely where the underwriter comes in. This is the notion, the idea is that like, the underwriter is this catch-all entity that is in charge of like, being, they are like the guarantor of the loan. Like, they attest to the loan's creditworthiness and they, they are the person that does everything in their power to make sure that loan actually gets repaid. So taking a very like meat space example, um, like if, if we're trying to put say like, uh, um, you know, like mortgages on the blockchain, for what it's worth, I don't think it's a good idea, but <laughs> like, let's just say that the, that's the example that we're doing. Um, there would be an underwriter that's actually originating the borrower, and then as part of their underwriting and as part of them trying to make sure that their kind of score, their rating is as high as possible, they're gonna go and like hire a collections agency to go and like actually go after the borrower when they don't repay so that um, the, the principal is at least somewhat recovered. Now, a better example would be like, um, just like straight like in margin loans, right? Like I, I, Tarek asked earlier about like, is there ever a need for an underwriter in like a fully collateralized context? And where it is necessary is or in order to initiate margin calls and liquidations, which is effectively kind of like the, the collections of the, the overly, co the over collateralized world. Oh yeah. Each, each law in each country are different, and also if you're offering it to everybody, then you don't really know like when you get that back in that country, rather than you know it's obviously very specific in the US and you generally get the money back because it's mature. But like a lot of other countries wouldn't have all these kind of rules. Um. Yeah. I mean, that's correct. I mean, this is part of the reason why I I don't. You know, the question was asked earlier about whether this is going to be like you know, directly helping the unbanked on, in the next like two or three years, like, no, it's probably not. It's, it's, it's precisely for these regions because it's really hard to collect on, uh, on international debt agreements. Um, but our kind of core thesis is that there is just like a whole other set of like new debt, like asset classes and new types of borrowers that are being created by this emerging industry um, that don't have access to any sort of credit market at all. We can build the, the infrastructure there um, and then hopefully in the future, we'll be able to generalize to more kind of meat space use cases. Um, once the technology is more mature, once the regulation is more mature, once like consumers are used to interacting with cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Yes? Interesting question. Um, that's something I've been toying with sometimes. Um, uh, I, it's a thought. It would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a safe, right? Um, we. Yeah, the, where it would make more sense is like, you shouldn't ever raise like debt for, comp like not ever, this isn't true. Most, most startups don't need to raise debt, right? Like most startups are an equity investment inherently. It has like a huge risk of down, downside and a huge like potential for upside. Um, debt is very much a different kind of asset. It's one that has a low downside risk and a low upside potential. Um, and so where it would make sense for us to say raise around in debt is like if we were to become a lender in the Dharma network ourselves. So it'd be like us getting a debt facility so we can go out and give loans. Um, maybe we'll do that one day, I don't know, but, <laughs> sorry? What about later stage? Um, even, yeah, I mean, when you see debt in like later stage for non-lending companies, it's like, Facebook needs a bridge loan to like get from their like series D or E or something to like their IPO. And it's like, it's just like at that point, like it's like, okay, we know that once you get this money, you're just gonna like hire expensive investment makers and you're gonna raise like a gazillion more dollars. So it's not like a risky investment. So sometimes that happens. So who knows, maybe in like five years when we IPO, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk again. Sorry. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned earlier two questions. One, you said that you wouldn't recommend a protocol like this for something like mortgages. And on your underwriters, how are the incentives for these underwriters better aligned than traditional underwriters like Moody? That's an excellent question. So um, there's two, well, it, it's, I got mainly one question out of there, which is about the incentives with the underwriters. So, um, so the question that was asked was like, how are the incentives in the underwriter system as it stands today in Dharma better than the existing sort of incentives for underwriters in the meat space world. Um, I'd say that they are better insofar as there's just like way more transparency in that like you can like 
really empirically evaluate like a signal for the underwriter's performance on chain based on how much was actually repaid to lenders as opposed to kind of like going off of a more informal heuristic. Um, now where there's room for improvement though um, is that like right now the way that the scheme works is that the underwriters get paid up front. So they get paid as soon as a loan is issued. Um, this is akin to kind of the way that underwriting works often in the real world um, in that like a lot of what was controversial about the run up to the financial crisis was the quote unquote originate to distribute model where you would basically go originate a borrower, um, you'd never hold the balance sheet risk yourself, you just go and sell it off to a big bank like the next day. That created like a lot of like really crappy incentives around things. And so I, I think that a better model that we're exploring at, at least at some point in the future implementing is having more kind of like explicit skin in the game for underwriters where they have to like either stake their own sort of tokens on um, given loans, uh, on like a prediction that they make for a given loan. This is a very loosely scoped idea. We, 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 this is like not hard plans yet, but um, we're playing around with a lot of models that basically add more explicit skin in the game and, and kind of reduce the incentive misalignment. And avoid civil attacks. And avoid civil attacks. Yes, that's a big one too. Yes. Um, so, you mean for the relayers, like who, people who are likely to be relayers? I think like, you know, in theory it could be anybody. I think realistically, um, we're probably talking about like upstart entrepreneurs who are trying to start like a, a business in the cryptocurrency sphere um, and want to build essentially a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace um, where all the sort of like hard work in creating a non-custodial peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending system has been done for them. Um, and to like be able to kind of like on day one tap into this existing pool of liquidity um, that is the Dharma credit market. So that, that's like the realistic answer for what it looks like. Yes? So, um, can you get, this might shrink the market, but if you were to loan on just collateral, so like I you know, loan you some money just for your house if you don't pay it, mm -hmm. this would get rid of the collateral aspect of having a, um, get rid of the underwriter aspect of your um, systems, right? So sorry, is, could you repeat the question one more time? I'm saying like, could you go towards like loaning on collateral, right? I loan So yeah, so the question is, is like, could we go towards a system in which we're lending um, like in collateralized loan agreements? That's actually what the system looks like now. So the system right now is mostly over collateralized loans where the collateral is held in a smart contract. And so there's not any need for there is some need, but, but for the, like, you know, at the current point in time, you don't need an underwriter. Yeah. Yes? Can you show us an example of a collateralized contract that defaulted and the movement of the tokens? Yeah, definitely. Um, let me see if I can. All right. Uh, any, any preference on browser? I don't know if you. Firefox. All right, all right. We're doing Firefox, guys. At Tarek's request. Um, so let's go to loanscan.io. Um, and we'll go into some Dharma loans. Um, okay, so we have some delinquent loans here. They're often like people just doing little tester transactions. Um, but let's try to choose one that's like more meaningful. So incentive mechanisms at work, it turns out when people collateralize real money, they're less likely to not repay. Um, okay, so we have a delinquent loan here. Um, the, sorry, let me see if they show the collateral being drawn. Perhaps a better example is, so I don't think loan scan actually shows you when the collateral is withdrawn, but if you go to supermax.cool, Excellent website. Um, you can go onto Dharma and see all smart contract calls that have been done here. 
This is actually a very cool website, <laughs> not just for Dharma stuff. But yeah, for instance, you can see someone here is like withdrawing their collateral after having like successfully repaid, um, and the tokens are getting transferred to them right over there. Or, um, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, or like they're making a repayment, or a loan is being filled, um, or right here the collateral is actually being seized by a lender. Um, in this case, correct, exactly. This is, and this is the core of why it particularly makes sense in a margin lending scenario to have an underwriter, because it's just like, it's like otherwise you have to continuously monitor things, it's not com comfortable for a lender. Um, we're actually building an underwriter to do this right now, so <laughs> that's why this is very fresh on my mind. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that, but that's, that's a little bit of a separate story. Um, this is a dev meetup, so I wanted to keep things pretty dev focused. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. Those so are, this was, uh, uh, collateral is what? Uh, do we know what the collateral is token ID 23. Uh, I can't off the top of my head tell you which one that is. Um, yeah, it's this token right here. Um, 0xC02, whatever is that that address. Can you put it in Ether's camera and tell us what it was? Yeah, why not? Let's do it. And, <laughs> this is wrapped ether, so yeah, it's, it's just ether. Um, and this is in like 10 to the 18th like mode, so let's see like, that is 0.23 ETH, which like, what is ETH, like $1 nowadays? Um, <laughs> um, we're probably talking about like $40, something like that, okay. less. Yeah, pretty small loan in this case. How can you uh, protect against civil attack if anybody can create a loan to themselves uh, and then pay off that loan as an underwriter and create a reputation? Yep, excellent question. So this is one of the core kind of like deficiencies in the, in the current underwriter model. It's why if you go onto the Dharma website, we like literally say like underwriters are trusted entities. They need to be trusted entities. Um, this notion of there being a reputation score for, for underwriters, it is flawed inherently. It's not something that is like trustless that um, is ungameable because of the exact sort of attack that Targ talked about. You could go and pretend to be the underwriter, borrower and lender, lend yourself money and continually, oh wow, I'm such a good predictor of loan defaults. Um, the idea is that you can, we, we kind of think of underwriters as being more similar to like, um, the, the analogy I like to give is like, you would never go back in the ICO heydays, you'd never go and just invest in an ICO if all you saw was just an address. And it was like, invest in this address, trust me, it's like trustworthy. Um, you always have some sort of social trust that gets like brought alongside that. You're gonna go to the website, you're gonna validate that they're, you know, uh, they've got this great team, all these awesome advisors, et cetera. Um, so in the context of underwriters, the way we think about it is like, um, you have an added layer of an empirical signal. You have some signal as to what their actual on-chain activity is, but the, at the end of the day, you do still want them to like be a known entity. You shouldn't be trusting an investment that is like um, underwritten by 0x ACD something. It should be an entity that you're aware of that has a certain public key that's associated with them. Yes. For, for underwriting, for, for? So if I want a low level credit score or some sort of rating that can tell somebody that I'm a good candidate to loan to, are you, like, do you think that's a new existing system or hope someone does it for crypto networks? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the way that I view, like, what the trajectory of things like Dharma will be is, like, really the, the, the core killer use case for um, decentralized lending, decentralized, like, exchange, all that stuff, is the stuff that people really like doing with cryptocurrencies today, which is speculation. Uh, like, and so, um, so really like the, the kind of, um, I, I believe that like the way in which we get to more unsecured loans in the future is via like originally like secured loans for particularly margin lending. Like I think that that's gonna be pri primarily where most of the usage is um, in the short term. Um, and what's nice about that is that you can kind of start to 
integrate in notions of creditworthiness in order to lower people's collateralization thresholds. And so you can start to compute a credit score for somebody saying like, oh, you have, you've taken out like 20 different margin loans here. You've always repaid. We've never had to liquidate your position. Okay, we're gonna like lower your threshold X amount, blah, blah, blah. And over time you can kind of like compute a score on them from this and kind of create your own sort of credit scoring system in the context of this sort of like environment. As for like whether traditional credit scores have a role in the system, in theory, yes. Like you could build an underwriter that goes and like pulls a FICO score on someone and like says like, look, according to um, Equifax, like they are like a credit worthy borrower. Um, but for a lot of reasons, I don't think that those are the, the types of lending use cases that really benefit from this sort of infrastructure. So yeah. Sorry, could you say that again? So, you know, if you are able to gather that data that this person has repaid a margin loan 20 times and yeah. you're a good candidate, you know, you could then use that information as something that's wordy or something that's, you know, people would use as social proof. Right, as an underwriter, exactly. So that, hence the idea of an underwriter, like this is per, per, precisely what the underwriter's role would be in the system. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, at, at certain points in time, uh, Dai was the most popular principal token in Dharma. It turns out, dollar peg tokens are really good for loans because like um, people like to lend out money and uh, have a certain expected interest rate that won't like fluctuate with the price of either. Um, and so I could try to like hunt for one down here, but I need to figure out what the the here you're not know actually. Let's go to loan scan then because that the UI here is much easier to use for that. Uh, die, 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 there we go. Those are $25 that are, had been lent out against $40 in ETH. So this is effectively in the context of things like margin um, is... Hold on, hold on, hold on. but that's a delinquent, right? That one's delinquent, that's correct. Isn't it interesting that you can literally be an exchange by lending die and letting people go delinquent and then claim the collateral of the ETH? <laughs> that's very interesting. Um, that's more of an option, technically. Is that what is doing? I'm not familiar with them, though, so I, I can't really help you out. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I don't think uh, the legal, yeah, TBD on that front. That seems like a really interesting legal argument. <laughs> um, I am not a lawyer. I'm not giving legal <laughs> advice on camera. <laughs> Or off camera, not ever, really. <laughs> awesome, guys. Um, well, if there's no more questions, this was a ton of fun. And we're at 8.30, we're good. Rock and roll. Oh, yeah, look, final, final plugs. Yeah, we're, we're hiring. Um, so if any of you guys are interested in engineering roles, product roles, design roles, et cetera, um, please give me a holler. Um, also, if any of you guys are particularly interested in margin lending, we are building a product that is a underwriter called Dharma Lever that is particularly for this use case, hence why I had a bunch of answers to do with that question. Um, and so if you are interested in being a tester of that or um, you know, helping build it, whatever, come talk to me. Anyways, this is a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much for letting me do this.